the Dublin Diplomatic Conference on Cluster Munitions was the meeting where we negotiated the new treaty banning cluster bombs. So it was by far the most important meeting in the whole process that's been leading up to that point. Uh, the meeting was held in a, in a football stadium uh, in Dublin, a Gaelic football stadium, and uh, which is unusual for diplomatic meetings. Usually they're held in New York and in, in Geneva, but this is not just any kind of UN process. This is a, a very different one. Uh, so the diplomats, there was about 100 and almost 130 countries showed up. Some of them with really big delegations, others with just a couple. Uh, and there was a very sizable uh, campaign presence there. So the, the negotiations, it took a period of about two weeks. Uh, uh, after the, the first week, the, the big meeting broke into smaller meetings where they discussed different aspects of the treaty. Uh, and then they came back in the middle of the second week, eight days later, and the president of the conference, an Irish ambassador, Dochi O'Callaghan, he had um, rolled all of these text amendments into a new treaty text and he handed it out in the morning on Wednesday the 28th of May and everybody took it away uh, and had a really close look at it. And then when we came back in the evening at 5 o'clock that night, he, uh, he, he caught us a bit by, by surprise when he asked if, um, if the countries present would be willing to adopt the treaty text that they had before them and not make any more amendments to the text. Uh, so that's what happened, basically. Uh, country after country started to speak and voice their support for the treaty. Uh, it was important that New Zealand, obviously, our country, was the second country to speak and was very supportive of, of getting the treaty. Uh, but the big powers who had been so difficult throughout the negotiations, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan, Australia, they all said this is a good treaty, we can live with it. Um, and the affected countries like Lebanon uh, and Cambodia also said this is a good treaty, uh, it's really groundbreaking. So that was the result of the conference. It took just eight days to negotiate the what it's called as the Convention on Cluster Munitions. What was the role of civil society at the conference? The non-governmental organizations that came to Dublin had a very important role that they played in the time there. That was the biggest delegation at any of the meetings to date. There was more than 250 campaigners from 61 countries. I came from New Zealand and my colleague Emma came from the Pacific. Uh, but there were cluster bomb victims from Afghanistan, Iraq, Laos, uh, sorry, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Iraq, Tajikistan. Uh, there were uh, deminers and people with expertise in clearing the weapon. There were lawyers, uh, really sharp lawyers. Um, there were technical experts, and everybody played a different role in Dublin. Some people were inside the diplomatic negotiations, inside the formal talks, listening very closely to what every government said, scrutinizing the uh, texts which, which, which were being prepared during the conference, uh, making interventions, because we can do that in this process from the floor. Uh, other people were outside the room building the buzz around the conference, uh, doing a lot of media work. There were stunts, popular stunts that we held outside the uh, and demonstrations. We held a demonstration outside the U.S. Embassy uh, and photo opportunities to get media attention to the conference. Um, uh, we also did some petition gathering on the streets of Dublin and uh, a bunch of different uh, actions to engage with the public of Ireland, which was also really uh, important, including a bus tour in the lead up to the conference. Uh, and we had our own room in Dublin. It was as far away from the diplomats as possible, but it was our space where we came together to strategize and to consider what was being negotiated uh, and to get our views on it and to talk about all of the different um, things that we're doing back in our countries. And that was the one other thing that happened is it wasn't just the campaigners who were there in Dublin who got the good outcome, it was everybody back in their capitals in London, in Berlin, in Tokyo, uh, in those countries who were working very hard as well to get their governments to, to take strong positions on the treaty. Can you explain the key points of the new treaty? So the new treaty is called the uh, Convention on Cluster Munitions. Uh, it's a complete prohibition on uh, the weapon. That means that uh, it bans their use, production, stockpiling, trade, uh, transfer. Um, 
It also bans assistance with any of those prohibited acts. Uh, it starts immediately, there's no transition period, which was one issue during the negotiations. Um, it's got a very strong definition of what a cluster munition is. And it's so strong that it basically outlaws every type of cluster bomb that's ever been used to date, and they've been used in many countries from and places from Kosovo to Lebanon to Laos. All those types of cluster bombs are banned under this agreement, as are the majority of cluster bombs that are held in the inventories of the countries that are going to join the agreement. Um, it's, it's a mixture of disarmament and humanitarian law in that it's got um, stockpile destruction, uh, they have to disclose how many cluster bombs they've got and they've got eight years to, de to destroy those stocks. But they've also got to um, figure out what areas of land are affected by the weapon if, they're, if they've been uh, bombed with cluster bombs. And uh, they've got to draw up plans to try and deal with that and to clear all of the cluster bomb remnants uh, within a 10-year period. Uh, so the, the deadlines are really important. Um, a lot of people pointed out the victim assistance the provisions as being quite groundbreaking. Uh, and they really put the, um, the rights of the cluster bomb victim first and foremost. Uh, those rights have to be respected and it obliges the governments who join it to provide medical assistance and rehabilitation and other assistance to the people who have been victimized by the weapon and that's a real first in these kind of treaties. Uh, it's got all the regular stuff in there about transparency reporting. Governments have to pass domestic measures, legislation, penal sanctions to make sure the treaty can be enforced in their home countries. Uh, it'll take 30 uh, ratifications, 30 governments have to do that legislation in order for the treaty to take effect. Uh, I guess the only what the CMC called the stain on the fine fabric of the treaty is this Article 21, which is called Relations with States Not Party, Parties to this Convention. And uh, the campaign has basically described that as the US article, the United States article. The United States was not in Dublin, but it made its, its presence felt in many different ways. Uh, it spoke out publicly uh, against uh, the treaty. It really didn't like this whole process where these kind of agreements can be drafted without their involvement. They could have participated, but they chose to sit it out. Uh, and one provision that they particularly didn't like was um, one that could could inhibit um, them from having their joint military operations and peacekeeping with countries that join up to the treaty. So they, so they and their allies sought to weaken that language in the treaty, and that that came through, unfortunately. But it, it wasn't the kind of make or break part of this agreement for the campaign. It was getting a strong definition, so we knew that we, what we were banning, and getting it to take effect immediately and making sure that it had all of those really strong humanitarian provisions in it so that we, you know, spend the next few years actually getting rid of the weapon. So we're very happy with the outcome. So what happens next in the Oslo process to completely ban cluster bombs? So on that Wednesday the governments uh, basically agreed verbally uh, that they could adopt the treaty or they didn't speak and they didn't object to doing that. Uh, so two days later the governments came back, the diplomats came back and they adopted the treaty. And that was when the president gaveled it through. And that's when you look at the treaty text, it's got 30 May 2008 written on it because that's the adoption date. Now all of those diplomats have to take that text back home and get it um, approved by their executives, their presidents, prime ministers, cabinets, whatever process that they've got, they have to get it approved so that they can then sign it uh, six months from now and the signing ceremony will take place in Oslo where the whole process started uh, and the treaty will be opened for signature on the 3rd of December 2008 and that's a significant date for us in many different ways most notably because it's the International Day for People with Disabilities uh, and it's also the same date that the landmine treaty was opened for signature 10 years ago so it's got quite a, a great degree of symbolism so between now and December, we have to build the biggest buzz possible around this agreement. We want as many countries uh, to come and sign in, in Oslo as possible. And uh, a total of 150 have participated in this whole process so far. We're challenging each and every one of them to come. Uh, in Oslo, countries can come just to observe it, and that's a sign of their good faith that they 
um, are okay with this process even if they don't want to sign it themselves. So observer states can come, states that have not been involved in the process can come, uh, China, Russia, India, Israel are more than welcome to come to the signing. But really, um, that moment is going to be for our foreign ministers, our defense ministers, our prime ministers, our presidents to give their assent uh, by signing the actual treaty document. Uh, so that's what we've got to do between now and the end of the year, is get the word out about the treaty in every way possible uh, and really promote it hard so that we get a great turnout in Oslo at the end of the year.